Okay, so you guys can see on the screen that this meeting is being live streamed or this panel is being live streamed. And as you guys all know, when you have registered, that only the hosts and the co-hosts will be seen. So um, please just uh, leave meeting if you're not comfortable with it and you can watch on Facebook Live or you can just click on the got it sign on the screen and then we, we can you can join us and proceed with the program. Awesome. So now that we are officially live on Facebook, let me just share my screen here. Okay, everyone, welcome to the second episode of Expert Talks. My name is Bay again, or Marie again. I go by she, her, and I am your host for today's event. I'm very excited to talk about um, the topic today, which is youth mental health. Um, and mental health is an important part of our lives, as you all may know. And, you know, as they say, health is wealth and mental health is a component of all health. So let's just keep that in mind as we go through the program. Um, but before we do get started, let's take this time to just go over some Zoom protocols. Protocols. So um, as you can see here, we have a uh, La, uh, option for captions. So for people that want to see subtitles, um, you can click, you can turn on your captions on or off. Um, you can also chat with the host and the co-host. If ever th throughout the duration of this panel, you have a question specific to them, then you can redirect it to them. Um, yeah. So again, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows to please continue muted. Um, and if you don't want to be seen on Zoom, then please uh, turn off your video. We, this is going to go live and this will go on our YouTube Facebook page. So um, yeah, just uh, make sure that you have those in mind and let's get right into it. So just a disclaimer, um, we would like to remind everyone that um, Oh, sorry. So at this time, I would like to remind everyone that this is not a counseling or therapy session, okay? Our guest panelists are not licensed counselors or psychologists. They are sim simply experts of their own stories and will share their lived experiences, their lived experiences. So let's just keep that in mind as we go along. We do have resources at the end of the panel to talk about how you can help um, people around you, even yourself, if you're going through a tough time. So please do stay at the end of the, the panel. Okay, so before we begin a brief anything, let's get started with the land acknowledgement. So it is important that we keep in mind um, the land that we live in. So the Experts Collectives is in the land of Alberta, and we acknowledge that Alberta is a traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples um, presently subject to Treaty 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kanai, Tikani, and Siksika, which is the Cree, Dene, Soltu, Nakoda, Shu, Stona, Nakoda, and the Tutsina Nation and the Metis people of Alberta. And this also includes the Metis settlements and the six regions of the Metis Nation of Alberta within historical Northwest Metis homeland. And we acknowledge that many First Nations, Metis and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. And we are very, very grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territories we reside on or are visiting. And I encourage everyone to get to know um, your, your land and get to know who has been in your land for a while. Um, indigenous people are everywhere. In, in everywhere, And um, it is good that we respect them and what they've done and what they've done to care for our nature. All right, so let, let me introduce our wonderful panelists for today. So we have uh, Miss Tommy George here. Uh, she is a graduate at the University of Toronto. Um, I've known her from the Esper Collective. So um, Miss Tommy, if you wanna go ahead and introduce a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, Bea. Um, hello, everyone. So as Bea mentioned, my name is Tommy. I graduated from U of T this last June. I did a double major in human bio and neuro with a minor in psychology. And um, while I don't exactly know uh, what I want to do career-wise, I am very passionate about youth and being able to provide support for them. So this, this talk is perfect and I'm excited to discuss with everyone about youth and mental health. Perfect, thank you so much. And wow, a bio major and youth 
at that tool, yes. <laughs> All right, okay, let's get on to our second um, panelist, which is my dearest Kuya Rossman. So Kuya Rossman is a wonderful teacher at CBE, and I know that he also starred, um, um, he did a talk in CBC. I don't know if he wants to talk about that, but go ahead, Kuya Rossman, and introduce a little bit about yourself. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Rosman Valencia, a community activist and also a public school teacher with the Calgary Board of Education. Um, I am currently teaching at Bowcroft Elementary School and also studying at the University of Calgary uh, with my master's in interdisciplinary studies with focus on the curriculum and also advancing social just healthy and safe communities and schools. So I'm really looking forward to start this uh, discussion with you as we know that this is truly important, especially we are living in this world of pandemic. So let's get it on soon. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Kriya Rossman. Um, so now we have our third wonderful panelist, which is Josiah. So I've known Jez through um, anti-racism movement at the University of Calgary, and they finally become an official club. So Jez, you can go ahead and introduce a little bit more about you. Hi, guys. I'm Josiah. I'm currently uh, still a student at the University of Calgary with a major in business analytics and a minor in music. And I do have a passion for helping the youth community. And again, I have this club called AR Movement, which is the anti-racist movement club, where we support youth and lived experiences so that they have a safe environment to talk about their experiences and hopefully educate others moving on so they can be leaders in the community. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Jess. Thank you so much for that. Okay, now that we have introduced our wonderful panelists, um, oh yes, we can enable. Now that we have introduced our wonderful panelists, um, I would like to take this time to welcome Miss Lisa to introduce what is the Expert Collective. So go ahead, Miss Lisa, take it away. Thank you, Bea. Thank you, Bea, for that uh, introduction. So I'm going to just give you a brief overview again. Hopefully the brief would be really brief uh, of what the Expert Collective is. And I'm going to be sharing my screen with you so that you can uh, see just the overview of our organization. So what is the Expert Collective? So the Expert Collective, we founded it uh, in 2020. Um, the Expert, is, it comprises of a team of diverse professionals who have been in the business for many de decades. Uh, we came together because we determined the need that we have to reach out to the vulnerable market and because of our passion for youth, which is like we call this project for the love of youth, and that's why we're here. So um, what drives tech? So this is our vision. We want to build a global network of experts from diverse fields to meet the evolving demands of our clients. And our mission is to bridge the gap between the Canadian immigration system and Canadian labor market and make it accessible to our clients through our unified stakeholders holistic service approach. And our goal is to help a global market of unprotected individuals achieve the life that they deserve. Um, what is our target market? Who is our target market? So the Canadians and landed immigrants, and those are the, the youth newcomers, the youth from First Nations and indigenous peoples, visible minorities, refugees, other racial minority communities, regulated, non-regulated professionals or practitioners, the skilled trade workers, uh, families, underrepresented groups. So for the third party providers, these are our uh, the, the, the practitioners, professional service providers, and they are the private organizations, not-for-profit organizations, governments. Uh, we seek funding from the government to support our initiatives or to achieve our mission. Uh, we reach out to the designated learning institutions as well. We reach out to language testing center, eligible, eligible banks, and all other organizations. Uh, we also help foreign nationals especially that we have a long list of regulated Canadian immigration consultants in our, uh, in our directory. So we reach out to the uh, foreign nationals and who would 
want to apply for permanent residents, international students, workers, and visitors. Um, for, and this is why we, we created or why we develop or build tech. So being an immigrant of Canada, we, we share the same experience, like the people who are involved in this organization share the same experience, especially for those immigrants. So we, we identify that there is like a gap between the Canadian immigration system and the, lab, uh, and the Canadian labor market, because uh, the government of Canada has listed all these parameters for us to come to Canada or to enter Canada or become permanent residents. So whether you are a foreign national, an international, a foreign worker, uh, an international student, or a visitor in Canada, the government has listed the parameters to entry to Canada. But however, when you become a permanent resident of Canada, somehow there is like kind of a gap because you cannot enter into your professional practice immediately because of, again, like the parameters that are being set by the Canadian labor market. And so that's the reason why we're here, because we want to help bridge the gap between these two. Um, so for the expert collective timeline, we started developing tech on uh, November 18, 2020. So we registered the business in 2020. This was in the like the peak of the pandemic. So somehow we, we came to realize what really our purpose is in this world. We run our own businesses, but somehow there's kind of like, like, like still a vacuum in there, how we can help more. And that was the time we, we conceptualized the expert collective framework and we registered this as a, initially as a private organization. Um, in, in December, on, in this, on December 29, 2022, we did a soft launch and a lot of uh, experts or professionals have been convinced that there is a need to do this uh, like, or to deliver this mission that we have. So in March, 2021, we supported three organizations in applying for the Canada Summer Job Funding because our, we first reached out to the youth. We know and we, we acknowledge that youth in Canada have so much potentials. And if they're only given the opportunity to show or should to showcase their potential, they can really contribute to our mission. And so we first started doing the Canada Summer Job Program and we were successful, we got the funding and that's how we started. And so if you can see here, the beautiful faces of our youth, they're the ones uh, initiating, building, developing uh, the events for the Expert Collective. Um, so in uh, between December 2020 to March 2021, we completed the list of 32 committed affiliates. So these affiliates supported us with providing us with funding through like uh, giving some like of their blessings. So they, they sponsored our projects, our programs, and we went on from there until, and this I'm very proud to, and we're honored to really announced this the, for the love of youth that we have applied to the government. So we were invited to submit um, a project proposal that is like a youth led uh, project. And so we came up, we developed for the love of youth project. And just uh, two weeks ago, we were granted or we were approved and we're just waiting for the funding from the government. So I'm very like excited to uh, announce further about it, more details about it in the next few months. And again, this is not going to happen without the support and cooperation of the beautiful faces here and all the sponsors, people that have supported or have embraced our, our vision, mission, and goals. And that's why one of those as well is our very own Rossman, who is our, one of the professionals. Um, so in going forward, so again, in September, on September 30, we switch into registering the organization as a not-for-profit organization because whatever, like the youth, the youth help us with conceptualizing everything about tech, and we we thought that it is more of like more of the not-for-profit and not like really private, like earning because it's all supporting the vulnerable market and the underrepresented groups, and one of those are uh, of those groups are youth. So, and we did, we, we planned to do the official launch, but because again, because of the surge of the pandemic, the COVID-19, we suspended or we canceled our soft launch. And, uh, but still we plan to do the, the official launch again, anytime this year. 
So uh, for now, this is our future. Where is the tech going to? So this is our plan. We want to implement the FLY project in the next two years now that we have a yes from the government. And um, we will reach out to the youth will help us out in reaching out as well to the international students because we know the international students right now and we've, we've acknowledged that they are being exploited. They are the group of the uh, like immigration market that, has, that is really very exploited by a lot of agencies, providing them with a lot of promises without knowing what to expect when they arrive in Canada. So uh, we, we wanna be active in that aspect we want to be more active in social media marketing and release more informational content. Uh, we want to reach out to the government units and, and ask them to help us out in continuing with our mission. Uh, we will develop more programs and uh, also offer business solutions. And for self-sustainability, we will continue to ask support from our sponsors. Uh, we will sustain if we're going to get funded again by uh, the government for the Canada Summer Job Program. We want to bring in or provide more ex work experience to the youth, to the Canadian youth. So just so you know, the Can Canada Summer Job Program is designed for the Canadian youth 15 to 30 years old. So we want to register or, or like reach out to other organizations globally and we want to target Philippines and Australia as we have many supports from there or um, like professionals who are who have known our organization. So for now, this is our ongoing project. So we have the Canada Summer Job Program. We're still awaiting for the funding again for this year. Hopefully we're going to get approved as well. We should be able to know it by this month. But again, for the Love of Youth project, um, we got approval for the expert development. It is ongoing and is also awaiting decision. We would be able to know the decision by fall for the expert development. So the expert development is that uh, we will be providing a work placement for the people who are already in Canada so that when they, or especially with the students, like internship, uh, co-op work, so that when they finish their studies, they are prepared to uh, integrate into the labor market. So that is the objective of the tech ed. Um, the services offered, uh, we provide uh, services to the private companies, not for, for, for profit organizations and individuals. So when we do private companies, I'm gonna keep on admitting people here, this is my job, so I'm doing presentation and doing admitting people as well. So uh, we, we support the private companies and place, again, place students or workers to them, not-for-profit organizations will help them with a business registration as a not-for-profit provincially and um, provincially and federally. And for individuals, we cater to, to their needs, to their specific needs. Um, so these are the people that are helping us realize this in the beginning and they're still here. And I'm just uh, happy to say that so far for um, uh, like our call for sponsors, call for affiliates, we have uh, right now we have like committed uh, uh, 50, about 50 or more than 50 people that are fully supporting us. But uh, for the individuals, including individuals, we, we kind of like have like around 70 people that are helping us right now. So these are our sponsors. And we also have organization or like people that are supporting at, us in different provinces, Saskatchewan, BC, Toronto, and USA. Uh, and for the not-for-profit organization so far, these are these sports organizations that are part of uh, our organization or that we have supported, should I, I should say. So I think that's it. And hopefully I, I just uh, did it briefly. Uh, time check, I did it in three minutes, Bea. Bea has only given me three minutes. So was it more than three minutes? I think so, <laughs> but sorry. Okay, that's what about uh, all about tech and hopefully we can give you more information in the next few months. Thank you and have a great day. And please stay tuned and listen to our speakers. Thank you, Miss Lisa. And it's okay, because I gave you, technically gave you 10 to 15. <laughs> so you're okay. You're completely fine. All right. So um, let's go right ahead into our presentation here. So I'll share the screen again. Um, okay, let me just 
fix this. Okay, so one first thing that we really need to talk about is to address the difference between mental health and mental illness as they are most often the not sometimes um, people use them intercorrect correlation, but um, there is a difference with them. And this one is coming from the source of uh, Taylor Counseling Group. Um, you can read it in their blog and we, we will also share their this links to anyone that is interested as some of our questions are based on research as well. So here we have the terms mental illness and mental health are sometimes interchanged, but they differ in meaning, as I've said. And while mental health refers to anyone's state of mental, emotional well-being, mental illness is diagnosed conditions that affect thoughts and behaviors. So we can think of mental health as something that we all have and um, mental health is, like, like they said, a state of well-being. But mental illness is, can be a disturbance in our thoughts, in our feelings and perceptions, and sometimes, um, most often, day-to-day -day functioning. So that's the difference between the two um, definitions. And I just wanted you guys to keep that in mind as we go throughout the discussion. So our first question is, an estimated um, this one is from the source, uh, Youth Mental Health Stats in Canada. So this one is specifically in Canada. And again, we can share some of the sources, um, the links, if you guys are interested in reading more about it. Um, just let us know and message us on Zoom or info at theexpertcollective.ca. So our first question is from this research. An estimated 1.2 million children and youth in Canada are affected by mental illness but less than 20% will receive treatment and an estimated 75% of children with mental disorders do not access specialized treatment services. So the question here is, why does, why do you, or as our panelists, or even, even um, for, for our audience that's watching, if you guys have any opinions that you would like to share, please do so. Our chat is open and you can talk to the panelists. You can ask them questions for our viewers on Facebook Live. Feel free to go ahead and, um, uh, chat us up on Facebook Messenger or the comments and we will gladly respond to you. So why do you think that regardless of the number of children and youth affected, there are youth that will still not receive treatment or do not access to treatment services? So anyone here can start. Um, you guys can go right ahead to anyone who's ready. Um, I don't mind starting on that one if you guys don't mind. For oh, sure. Unless, oh. <laughs> You can go ahead, Josiah, and I might follow after you. Yeah, I'll pass it on to you afterwards. Um, I believe that youth choose not to receive treatment a lot of the time because I think traditionally it's been rooted that mental health uh, isn't something to necessarily important to focus on or that mental illness doesn't exist. Um, I think generationally, as more topics are being brought up and generations like us, the youth, we kind of bring this up as a, a problematic topic that isn't discussed further because it just wasn't discussed or learned about back then. But now that we're getting all these conversations started, it's something that's generated a lot of uh, focus upon where people are more aware of it. And I think now maybe youth feel should feel more encouraged to do that but I just know back then especially when I was in elementary uh, junior high I didn't have a lot of these like mental health topics conversations or resources um, so I know that for me it just wasn't something that was necessarily um, being brought up as often as it should have mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's that's very that's a very good like like start to the conversation like stigma is a really big thing right because as you're growing up people don't people are not open in talk, talking about it right they're not talking about it in education and sometimes they encourage you to take counseling but I mean from my experience when I took some counseling it was very um um I don't know how to say this but it was just very like ABC like they, there wasn't much of a conversation going around it. They were just saying like, oh, this is this is what classes you need to take. And um, if you need help, go to the nurse kind of thing. Yeah. So that was that was all the conversation going on um, when it comes to like asking for help or asking for extra assistance. And sometimes your teachers are even the ones that are um, that you would rely on and like, you know, to, to actually talk to and have like a genuine conversation with. Right. So, yeah, Kuya uh, Rosman, what do you think about it? 
I would like to support what Josiah actually mentioned. Number one um, issue is really the stigma because mental health issues uh, and mental illness has a very bad light when it comes to the community, especially in the racialized community. Um, I would like to give a little bit of a perspective as a history major, right? Um, it, we also have to look into the context of culture here. So usually before, who is our mental health advocate? These are our folks. These are the elders that we gather together to, to talk about what we are feeling, what we are, how, how we view the world. And so that is our that is our counseling. And so that community aspect is what we racialized people, more likely the Filipinos, the people of color, we rely on that. And so it's the family that fixes it. It's the society that fixes it or that that opens up the conversation however um it seems like that there is really this this individualized notion when it comes to mental health and mental health and mental illness and that it is a journey of a person alone to embark on this if you will seek the mental health or mental health and help through the professionals. So that's one of the things that we have to look into that this is kind of foreign to everyone, individualized um, um, treatment services, the specialized one are, are pretty new, but, in, but also we have to look into the reality of things now. It is extremely expensive to seek specialized treatment services and with this expense right what will happen to the budget of the family if this will not be if this will if we will seek for specialized treatment aside from the stigma it's the economic factor that always is at stake because number one if we do this what will happen to our rent what will happen to our finances Right. So these things are barriers that I see and that research is also saying why men, why people, especially children and youth in Canada, why they don't seek help. It's the stigma and the economic barrier when it comes to seeking help. I know for sure that there are a lot of services that are available for youth. However, we also have to take into account the racial, the, the racial profile of the clients, right, who will seek help, in which most of the time, the mental health specialized treatment is based on um, specifically to the Caucasian clients. So we have a lot of systemic barriers to look into this. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, like that, exactly that last point, because I know when I was looking to um, seek some, some counseling, is that I couldn't find someone that I was able to relate to, because as we all know, every, every culture has different experiences, and if, if the counselor or the person that I'm talking to cannot relate to me or cannot, um, I guess, give proper advice that I'm able to carry out, then I... I can't take away anything from the conversation. And um, in terms of like the economic, yeah, exactly. In terms of the economic um, well-being of families too, I know my parents, they've, they've been really open about like, um, like my mental health per se. Like I would always say like, maybe, maybe, you know, I need to get help. And they would be like, yeah, yeah, why don't you? But then it's in the back of my head. It's always like, oh, but will insurance cover it? Like, I don't, I don't know what, um, like up to what I can actually access to, right? Because an hour can probably last like, like an hour will probably be like 300. I don't, I don't even know. And that's, that's like one of the barriers that I'm facing right now. Right. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. What about you, Tommy? What do you think about this? Yes, I think you, everyone brought up really good points. The kind of main things that were on my mind were culture and then the fact that treatment is usually quite expensive. But I think from my experience, culture has definitely been something that has made me a bit hesitant to, I guess, like talk about my mental health. Like I'm, I'm Nigerian, 
Um, I remember having a conversation with my mom, just kind of hinting that like, you know, I don't think I'm doing quite well. This was in 2020, I was doing with school and COVID and everything. And I remember her just being so confused <laughs> about like <laughs> what yeah. I was talking about, almost as if she didn't understand what it was that was making me, mm -hmm. I guess, not feel so good. Because back home, she would talk about the fact that people, you know, are walking this many miles to school. And so to her, she, she sees our life here where you have shelter, you have food, you have these things. And she doesn't understand that there are other factors that can still um, affect you and that you should seek help for. Um, yeah. So I think besides everything that you guys said from my personal experience, just that cultural narrative has been something that made me um, a little more hesitant to seek help. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Like the intergenerational difference in understanding what mental health is, right? Because like exactly mm -hmm. what my dad exactly said to me when I told him like, I'm having it so hard in school right now. <laughs> and then he was like, he was like, uh, everyone has it hard in life. <laughs> yeah. And I could not. I mean, I, I agree, you know, I, like people have it hard, but I guess like their experience are of course definitely different from mine. And that's that's kind of the hard part about trying to understand with your parents and yourself too, is that um like they they're also going through their own um uh, mental health uh tr or trying to thrive with their own mental health trying to take care of their own mental health in their own way but i think for our generation we're really just more open about it we're op we're more seeking help now rather than kind of holding it in as to what our parents did back then right yeah and kuya rasman he has something to add on to yeah great points everyone um another another just to add up with what we already have here for in the conversation is also the factor that um it, this is because this has become a domino effect right like our parents did not seek help because they have the social supports that they have like for example um number one uh they have the church they have their they have the church right so that's the social yeah. emotional help for them and also they also have the families that they have together which usually then was bigger and so moving forward now if we will also take a look into the schools um it is not accessible at all. I am speaking in behalf of, it, it, not in behalf, but as, as a teacher, like there are no resident psychologists and professionals that are in the classrooms or even in, in specific schools. So for example, if there will be a guidance counselor that are the counselors, which we know are very, very important when it comes to leading our youth into the right path that they need to have to build their resilience. A guidance counselor is usually shared by two or three schools. And two or three schools can have a population of how many students? 600 or more students. Now, mm -hmm. is that in, rea in reality, is that something that a guy guidance counselor can do? Absolutely not. Reality, that's no. not the way that we can achieve that. But another, uh, another factor that I also wanted to say is the fact that um, youth in general and, and children, in order for them to absolutely seek help, relationship building is the key. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if relationships are not built why would i open up myself to you yeah it is an ongoing um factor that we have to do as teachers but also it is the same thing for the professionals and mm -hmm. if that relationship is not built then there's no trust then there's no attachment why would i open myself for you have mm -hmm. this conversation to have this difficult conversations yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah see that's 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 a, a great point because i mean that but that brings up the you know what i'm going to move to the next question i'm thinking that this is the 
education one. Okay, no, I'm going to move up to question number three, because I you just brought up a great point about the whole education system and how like it works. And so just to give everyone a background. So we have this study from the Liberté and uh, Varco, and um, the participants express a concern in the curriculum, curriculum, school curriculum, describing it as archaic, soul crushing and killing the desire to learn. Very, very powerful words. And, you know, like, so, I, I highlighted this because I felt like, oh, I kind of feel that way. And what, what, what you said, um, Kuya Rossman, like with how th there's no relationship building, which makes me kind of think about um, why, why would like schools have just like two counselors for a group of 600, probably even like even more students. And that, that's why like students would rather go to teachers but teachers are sometimes you know like they're not sometimes they may be not prepared for that kind of talk sometimes maybe they're not trained for that kind of talk so what what is like what do you guys think can make this education system better and is there anything that we can change to support um children to support uh to better our education and anyone can start again into this one I think going off of the point that was just made regarding relationship building, um, I think one thing that could be improved, kind of like you just mentioned, Bea, too, is just maybe training teachers to, I guess, provide more support for the youth. Just thinking about the amount of time that you spend with your teachers compared to the one guidance counselor that may be at your school like mm -hmm. once a week. I think if the teachers are more equipped on, I guess, having mm -hmm. these conversations or just listening to their students, um, that might be helpful. Um, I also think the education system right now seems very um, like cookie cutter, you learn this, you learn that, yeah. everyone's learning the same thing. And I feel like it kind of disregards um, everyone's experiences. So I guess I wish there was a bit more freedom and a bit more leniency um, in the system. But I'm sure, Rossman, you can touch more on it since you <laughs> actually have the experience of a teacher and you can maybe give light to like the type of training that mm -hmm. you do receive and for topics like these. Mm -hmm. Um, I can definitely speak about my experience as a teacher. Um, I'm really privileged and grateful that I actually had the opportunity to further myself when it comes to um, training, when it comes to youth mental health, and then um, and then in dealing with youth. So we are actually in my school where where I work. We are privileged enough to not only have the training for therapeutic crisis intervention or the TCI, because not all the school actually has the access to do so yeah. because it's a very expensive program. So mm -hmm. our staff actually decided to focus on uh, to focus not only in youth mental health, but also to focus on um, resiliency building with our students yes. because resiliency building is one of the keys that the key things that we actually have to build on the the children in order for them to use the capacities that they have learned and mm -hmm. also sit in a difficult situation right mm -hmm. however resiliency building is not something that we can just do overnight you have mm -hmm. to also talk about you all you have to also factor in economic factors and yeah. protective factors at home and with the society but also there is what we call the executive function that also needs to be developed with the children and mm -hmm. so i am learning all these things not only due to the um to the therapeutic crisis intervention that I'm getting, but also this is the topic of my research with, with the University of Calgary. And so when it comes to the curriculum, right, um, I totally agree with the research. Coming from the system, yes, it's archaic, it's old, and it needs to change. Yeah. 
one factor here is I believe that I believe that the health education curriculum it was actually um, revised around the year 2000, and it was actually developed um, in the early 90s. So it's really old from the perspective of education system and curriculum experts. Curriculum should be changed every five years. Mm. How many years are there? It's already been what, 20? 20, 20 or more. <laughs> and so that's something that we really have to look into and we really have to advocate for changes on that because yes, I totally agree with Tommy. It's cookie cutter kind of curriculum that we are exposing. Why? Because this is coming from that industrial model of education where this is what you need to learn in order for you to get the job. But if if there is something that I want to change I or that we, we need to change, one, yes, there should be more trainings when it comes to teacher education, especially when the pre-service teachers can actually go and learn more and be more equipped when it comes to um, dealing with mental health and health education in general. But also the curriculum has to be changed and has to be updated because yes, it's so archaic. But another factor that we also have to consider when it comes to the education system is that we have to understand that teachers cannot do the work alone. It yeah, takes yeah. A, vi a village to educate a child. Therefore, it is. it also takes a village to mold the executive function of children, to mold their resiliency, and also to mold these protective factors that the psychologists and social workers are saying that are important in order for them to, to be the successful and mentally healthy adults that they can be if there are a lot of issues at home yeah. schools can be the protective factor however re-traumatizing can happen too how mm -hmm. again it now becomes a village the village is you me the teachers and also the community in general in which sometimes it's hard because those are many perspectives coming up, right? It becomes so yeah. overwhelming. However, yeah. we have to sit down, have a dialogue. What's the culturally up and what's culturally appropriated intervention that mm -hmm. we can do with these students slash children? Mm -hmm. Yes, very well said, Kriya Rossman. And I just want to like highlight the fact that you said that it takes a village to teach a, a child. Because from my experience, like going back into my high school, um, my high school memories and my high school experiences, I remember having like um, very well for me personally. I had I know I had a lot of support with my teachers and my fellow classmen, but I also feel like mm, there's some students that are very, very like racialized and that have not gotten the same access that I think I have and I'm very privileged to you know be who I am and like like um because I was I was in the international baccalaureate program so I got a little bit more care and I feel I felt that some of the students in other class and other like classes that are not in the same like IB or whatever that they didn't find the right support. And going back into that comment where it takes a village to raise or or not to raise to, to teach and to raise a child sometimes is that like it's hard for them to find that kind of support in a place where where that doesn't welcome them or where it just kind of belittles them or they already have the stigma that the child will not do well. And I like I feel that that is such a harmful way of seeing of seeing like a specific nationality or like a specific child because like that that child can can only rely on their family and like you said if the family or if the friendship is not doing well then then how can we care for that one specific child and that's that's where the village comes in right and yeah so I, I definitely agree. Like people really need to, um, I feel like one thing for me, I think anti-racism is one of the powerful tools too. And um, 
for anyone, for anyone, for businesses, schools, individuals. We just really need to, to understand our history and learn how we can better help people and how we can better understand and communicate with each other. Because I think that that's such a, a big thing in education, right? And yeah, Tommy, you can go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, something you what? said just reminded me of, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> just make sure I'm <laughs> unmuted. Um, I used to volunteer with, I guess, this initiative called Imani um, during my undergrad. And basically it was a program for black youth, kind of like what you were saying. Um, they ran a bunch of studies and found that a lot of the teachers weren't really offering them support or they would recommend um, courses that were, I guess, like not good enough to go yeah, like into below. like below. Yeah, I'm trying to think, I guess like our equivalent of like, was it dash two, dash three? Like dash like, three, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the Ontario equivalent and a lot of the teachers would just be like, oh no, like you can only just take this course. And they found that, um, Black students were very underrepresented in a lot of the universities. So this initiative kind of, it provided like an after school program for them to just help them with their homework, to help them learn like the university admission process and help them apply. Mm -hmm. So I think another thing that could be helpful when we talk about, I guess, like racialized students is providing maybe extra programs to um, mm -hmm. uplift them and like teach them things that they just need or even just to provide the support because a lot of the times we also just um, kind of acted as mentors for these these high school kids because they just needed someone to talk about their experiences well, with racism or just in general being a teenager right so yeah that's another way that we could improve the education system yeah perfect answer and you just wanted to add on something yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I don't know if I have a lot of time to speak up on this, but um, okay, take your time. Gonna... Take as much as you need. Right? <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, last week I actually attended my old high school, and I was on a panel for speaking upon anti-racism. Mm -hmm. And when I went to this panel, I noticed that there were there weren't a lot of students who attended. And given that there weren't a lot of teachers that came on top of that, there weren't any colored teachers in the school. Um, and there weren't even a lot of white teachers who came as well. Um, the only teacher that, uh, the only teachers that came was um, one of my family friends who was a teacher there, she's Filipina. And then another who wasn't a teacher at the school anymore. And he's a part of the Black Teachers Association and he came to help organize everything. And I was like, where, where are all the teachers? And they were like, oh yeah, they're just teaching their normal curriculum because they wanted to. And I was like, did they know about this day? And they were like, oh yeah, no, we promoted it several times. And um, in doing that, I was like, okay, interesting. So they just chose not to come. And they were like, yeah. And I listened to these uh, students who sat in front of me during the panel. Uh, they were students of color. And they were like, yeah, we don't have teachers to relate to in this school, so it's hard to talk to them about our problems. And mentally, it's quite challenging. And I was like, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Like, what do you guys have going on in the school to help you uh, handle those kind of issues? And they're like, oh, well, we created a Black Student Association within the school for ourselves because there's no That's Black teachers. So, so good. Right. And I was like, that's awesome. And they're like, we created an injustice uh, club. Mm -hmm. We created a women's empowerment club. We created a mental health club. And I'm like, these are all awesome. And it's really sad, though, that the students had to create these clubs themselves. Yeah. I wasn't even in the high school when they had these kinds of clubs. I didn't even know they could create these kinds of clubs. <laughs> and um, they're like, yeah, there's there's nobody else who could really um, who could really help us here. So we really got to like rely on ourselves and that yeah. to me was really really upsetting to hear about um mm -hmm. so if I were to change anything about the education system it would be to just push teachers especially to want to learn about their students um yeah it has to be like a genuine urge it's not mm -hmm. like a thing that you got to be like oh attend this seminar I think teachers who come into the workforce to be educators have to consistently and constantly learn about their students and that doesn't have to just be the cookie cutter curriculum mm -hmm. I think that's that's my opinion on that 
Yeah, yeah, because like what what you said is very us versus them kind of thing. I mean, coming as a student ourselves, like there's only a few teachers that we could have relied on. There's only like if our if our parents were not going to listen to us, then it's the next is your teachers or your friends. But sometimes your friends can't handle also like all the issues that they have going on too, or like all the burden that they have going on as well. So the next option is your teachers. And I felt like for me, I've had, luckily I've had like two teachers that I was able to relate on, but wow, like that, like those people that created themselves, it just goes to show that they really have their own support system, but they don't have the proper help and the proper resource to do it. Because I mean, yes, okay, they made they made a club and, and like, yes, they're very empowered right now, but who's going to guide these people to, to make like, to, in, to in welcome more people and to like, to really foster, you know, the, the group's well-being, right? Because you can make a club as much as you can, but I mean, already like, and um, Jess, you can speak on this a little bit. If you start a club, there's like, only so many things you can do without the support of others because like like again a club is a club it's not just for you you know and you want to you want to release the you want to get the word out you want to have more resources you want to train more people want to want to do so many things but if there's no support from an, a reliable adult then there's no guidance whatsoever that children will get lost right so yeah so this, does anyone else want to add on a little bit to this one Yes. No. Uh, well, it, this is not an addition, but it is. I am. I am really getting uh, emotional here because oh. this is this is what we need. This is what teachers are. To me personally, as a teacher, this is what I also look for. And we are. I would say that I, I as a teacher, try to be as much as I can an ally and hoping to be, you know, an accomplished for, for what my um, students would like to advocate for. May it be mental health or may it be about their gender, their sexuality, right? Um, yeah. and, and hearing from you, our future leaders, future leaders, future entrepreneurs, future, um, the future of Canada, we, we really want this to happen and so this initiative is re this initiative from you it's really something that we have to do together and and mm -hmm. please know that there might be a lot of teachers especially racialized one that are not standing with you right now or that are not visibly standing up with you right now but we are here and we are always proud of the work that you are doing that's good to know. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kira Rossman. See, that's the thing. There's always, like I said, it's, it's not all teachers, right? And like you said, Jez, it really is like the drive and you really need to have that innate willingness to learn and innate like, um, like, a. Uh, like just just the passion to help the the people around you and i definitely do feel like it's sometimes it's because of like the relevance of like the history and culture wise and experience wise i feel is a really big thing because if the teacher sometimes is, cannot relate to the experience of the student it's hard for them to to help them you know and and that's why like like encouraging like more more um more black or more uh, other ethnicities to become teachers and become educators will really help children, right? And I think that goes back to the point where um, where some some people or some racialized people are not put into those into those high school courses that will get them into education. And it's such such a big issue because why? Like I think one thing is that you really just need to push some of these people to get extra tutoring help them a little bit more and you know like it, it really is just just the effort of um some teachers and again not picking all teachers my experience with some of the teachers are really great so yeah um does anyone else would like to add or i can move on just continue we can move on perfect okay so let's go back seriously to question number two um so let's just go back to question number two real quick. So this one is again, the same study. Um, this is the same by La Liberté and Varco. And they found that youth struggle to seek financial security and or imagine what their lives would be like if they had financial security. So I was just telling our wonderful panelists here how very timely this question is because of the eco economic situation that's going on in Canada right now. Thank gosh, it's April first, and um, gas prices have gone down. But I mean, I mean that whole month 
a, a little bit I guess. <laughs> it's very very tiny but that whole month of having gas prices out like 167.9 like it, I mean I pay for my own education and I I I could not handle it. I felt like, I really felt like I needed to like work extra. I needed to like find like, find ways of income. And sometimes, you know, like for me, I, I was really thinking about it. Like, do I really want to make more income or do I just want to focus on schooling? But it's so hard to focus on schooling when you don't have money coming in, especially like if you're a student and you're trying to save for the future. It's, it's just very difficult. But yeah, so the question is, do you think that there's a relationship between financial security and mental health for the youth? And how do you think financial security affects you and your mental health? So I've shared mine. Um, obviously, I'm very passionate about this one. But if anyone would like to go, you guys can, can go ahead and jump right in. Jazz, tell me. I, I could start. Um, go ahead. I mean, um, I I believe like what you said, financial security is a big thing. Like no brainer towards your mental health because with the gas prices, even groceries, oh my goodness. I just wanted to do some wholesome baking on one of my days <laughs> off and I went to the grocery store and I was like, oh my God, like I can't believe all these groceries to make one little thing cost more than 50 bucks. It's insane. And like, I'm not working, right? I'm in school and I'm just like, this, <laughs> this hurts me deep down inside. Cause mm -hmm. like, even for things such as groceries or gas, um, if that's too much for people to be able to afford, like look at mental health resource, like what we were talking about previously, like therapists. And I know during the pandemic, some of my friends were talking to me and they're like, can I please vent to you right now? Because I can't afford a therapist. Um, I can't afford some of these apps for my mental health and I don't know who to go to. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my goodness. Yeah. You, you can rant to me. I'm always a good friend to rant to. Um, and it was just really sad, especially because of the pandemic. I think it's been a long few years for a lot of people to go through things by themselves and it was a big time where people didn't know where to get mental health resources and because of the financial downfall it's like who's going to be able to afford some of the things that they need financially mentally you know um I do think financial security affects your mental health in that way um mm -hmm. I mean uh, speaking as a student, if I did have a lot of money, I wouldn't be so focused on how do I, um, how do I get my tuition? How am I going to be able to pay off these fees? How am I going to be able to afford groceries? Blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah. I'd be so much more focused on schooling as opposed to all these yeah. other things, which can affect the way that I focus in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I feel the exact same thing. Because when I mean, we're all still like, we're also like doing some sort of studying and we're all, we're all lifelong learners, right? And I feel like, especially now, as, oh my gosh, speaking of the groceries, I mean, <laughs> you try to eat healthy in this, in, in this <laughs> economy and you just can't. I no. was trying to go to the gym religiously. I was trying to eat healthy and like eat more vegetables and all that stuff. And, and, you know, part of, part of your physical health, I mean, a part of your overall health is your physical health too. And if you like, like people just have so much, so much. Um, now I've seen all of my friends have like body dysmorphia or anything like that, and they've all just been pushing themselves to go to the gym, to go eat, and it's just, it's just so hard to see because you can, you can tell that like you're really, like aside from your mental health, financial security wise is just not, it's uncertain because I, I, I paid like eighty dollars for five pieces of groceries. $80 and I was so so surprised and I was like I don't think I'm ever doing it again I feel like it's so much cheaper to just buy takeout food which is so unhealthy for you than to just like make your own food at home and that's like that that's so scary because 
I, I also feel like with um in re in relation to education, we barely have knowledge on like finance. We don't have we don't know how to save. We don't know what options we have like TFSA, RRSP, RESP. Like what's what's all these you know all these things and it's it's difficult because when people do come to like talk about these things you know sometimes like sometimes it's for good things but sometimes it's also like oh like i'm just trying to like sell you like insurance and stuff like that and it's not really it's not really helping me as an individual because sometimes like for for me personally when i was going through a, a financial turmoil um the, someone offered me like insurance and then I had to like I had to decline the first time because uh, you're expecting me to pay $130 every month um, until I'm dead and then wh where does my money go you know like I, I have no idea so financial security and mental health wise it's so uncertain and I it's honestly such a hard topic because we you don't even know what to say you know you don't even know what to what to expect with your money. So, and that's only like what the money that you have now, we don't know about student loans and all that stuff, like about the future, how it's gonna go. But yeah, um, Kuya Rossman, do you wanna add on something? I totally agree on what you say, <laughs> all of you, <laughs> because, okay, to add on to that, okay, we are really seeing the interconnectedness of economic security mm -hmm. and physical well-being and emotional well-being how can you be physically fit if tomorrow your family mm -hmm. is thinking about the food that is needed to be on your table can yeah. you sleep no probably not can you absolutely relax and that everything will be taken care of mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. not so this is a call right now i'm just trying to simplify the factors that are that are being talked about it being talked about here this is now a call for us to look at differently at how mental health capacity should be built and also mental health in general should be looked at because mm -hmm. we have to understand that economic security or we will not be able to achieve mental wellness we will only get stressed we will only get um physical issues emotional well-being this uh, like distress and emotional well-being mm -hmm. if we are not secured when it comes to our economic um capacities yeah this tells us now that we need to solve socioeconomic issues mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and at the same time that will save or prom not promote, but it will also um, secure the mental wellness. If we yeah. do not take care of, of the economic, socioeconomic issues, then mm -hmm. mental wellness cannot also be achieved. This is the interconnectedness of these things, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we as individuals, we as community and the government and schools and other communities should really look at the interconnectedness of these two because if we don't we are definitely not making any change in the lives of the youth yeah yeah exactly because i feel like everything is just so i mean like mental health like mental wellness it's different aspects of your life right and so financial security is definitely one of them because i mean if like looking back into education again if you think about it some people don't even pursue education because they don't want to take student loans and they they pay it out of the pocket so what do they do they work full time first they save up and then they go back to school but then what does what's the effect of that and that like people sometimes have stigma like oh you're gonna graduate late or oh like like um 
you're not gonna be able to finish this early that kind of stuff you know like it's just such so much expectation but at the same time like what can what can you do in that situation you know like your living situation you you can't change anything because I have to pay for school but that means taking my time you know that means that means needing to save up every semester just so I can go to school and finish my degree and some people just don't really understand that and I feel like that really affects you know your your mental health too so yeah Tony did you want to add on anything before I go to the next one no, I totally agree with everything that's been said I know they say you know money won't solve all your problems but I <laughs> like in the day and age we live in like everything costs money so I think definitely some of your problems can be eliminated right because kind of like Gossman touched on if you're having to worry about food on the table rent you're not going to be thinking about the fact that your mental health is declining and yeah. even thinking of another aspect with like the effect it has on the household if you are not financially secure likelihood is maybe um, both parents are working they're working long hours they're maybe not going to be home as much for the kids um, compared to maybe a family that is more financially stable and secure where the children have um, let's say hobbies and activities that they can do to decompress and and help with their mental health that another family might not have access to so I think there's definitely um, different components of one's life that is affected by financial security because we just live in a world where everything costs money <laughs> like yeah you know, so yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, and to re and I just wanted to add on to that because in relation to that, like like you said, parents are working two jobs now in 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 this mm -hmm. in this lifetime. Sometimes kids needs to work a job too at like the age yes. of fifteen. It's crazy, and yeah. you know, like it's like imagine imagine the burnout. Imagine needing to work like a full time job and you're not even ready for it. I mean, like I mean, like I know. Let me just promote the expert collective real quick, <laughs> because I know that the expert collective is, um, you know, providing like many, many job opportunities for, for youth like our age, people in universities mm -hmm. to get the experience right to get like a, a good job. Um, and, and yeah, so um, to promote the expert collective, I'm actually going to get uh, Miss Lisa to talk a little bit about like the fly, the fly project here. Um, yeah, and you have three minutes, Miss Lisa, if you're still in the room. Oh, okay, do you wanna do it later? Okay, <laughs> towards the end. Okay, we're gonna promote towards the end. But yeah, so yeah, regardless of the fly project framework, so let's move past that. So yeah, I just like, I was just thinking about like the burnout and the different kinds of opportunities that people need to get. Cause I mean, I mean like retail is, you know, retail is a good start job. Like I, I, for me, I, I'm very happy that I was able to um, gain more character through, through my retail experience with, uh, with Nike, you know, and it's, it's been great, but at the same time also like, like if you're not, if you're going to school and if you're not really doing the same thing that you're studying, it's so unmotivating to continue your education and it just feels like such a waste of money. And so yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, there's just so many things with financial security. And that's why this question was up here because like you can go into so many ways with financial security. And so that's why like, that's why I just thought of bringing it up. But are you guys okay to move on to the next one? Yeah, okay. So we're gonna go on to question number four. So we went from three to two to four. So now it's four. So um, speaking of um, social media so why do you think youth resort to social media as a source of support in times of distress so i just wanted to first introduce um the, the term burnout because i realized that like in with social media there is so many pressure in social media to to um what's what's the right term that success means popularity and income success means this and this and this like it, it just means more it doesn't mean like in your own terms and that's what I feel like is happening with social media nowadays is that like there's a lot of pressure for youth um especially youth that are just about to graduate 
to to have a good job right out of university to like start a family live a life have this money have this car and it's just like like that's like an unhealthy thing that I've noticed with social media but a healthy thing that I've noticed with social media is there's a lot of educated influencers that share some information on social media such as like um this is like what it looks like for, for example I, I'm not sure what their name is but for example like fitness gurus sometimes they share about um, their own mental uh, mental health journey and it just encourages more people to be open about their own mental health journey too like oh maybe if the social media uh, maybe if this influencer is um, seeking help then maybe I can too because if she can do it I can do it you know that kind of thing but yeah I, w- I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on social media and how you think it's affecting um the generation now the youth nowadays so anyone can go to if you like yeah Jess go ahead okay I can start this um this is per this is like me personally um I don't know what you guys think about it but honestly I have like a love hate more so hate towards social media um, because of the reasons that Bea, you listed. Like um, lots of people, I just think a lot of it is fake, which can be super toxic for the youth, which can also like generate a cycle of uh, mental health negativity, um, which is, which are the reasons why I really dislike it. Um, But the reason why I think youth do that um in a time of distress is because it's just a stress reliever it's like away from reality and Mm. you're just situated in yourself with your phone whether that be scrolling on tiktok until 2 a.m or instagram reels because then you're just it's like another a new way of entertainment for you i know growing up I didn't really have an iPhone and social media to scroll on, Mm -hmm. but now I see my younger cousins and that's all they're doing. Um, And that's just what they're known to do. Like that's just their go-to now. Um, They don't, I don't know one of my cousins who picks up a book now because they're (laughs) trying to de-stress. Like I know that they pick up that phone right away and then they start scrolling through social media. Um, but yeah, I just think it's like a good way for them to get out of reality because it's like, especially because social media is generated on your personal feeds and your, mm-hmm. your personal analytics. They're giving you entertainment based to you and your personal preferences. So it's mm-hmm. easier for them to get lost in that. And I think that's just like a whole cycle that causes them to do that. I won't say it's necessarily healthy. Um, it's mm-hmm you know, but I think that's just what happens, especially now in this generation. And because of the pandemic, kids have had their phones and their tablets to them. That's all that they had. So again, it could also just be a habitual thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I I just have a follow-up question because now that you're saying that, you know, kids have like tablets and like they would rather pick up tablets than like picking up a book and everything like that, right? Like, how do you, I want to, I don't want to, I want to question, I want to form this question correctly, but how do you think, like, or why do you think they, they are more encouraged to pick up like a phone or like a, an iPad more than they are to go outside to play or read a book? Like, do you think, do you think that there is something that's, that's triggering that kind of behavior or anyone can answer too, but yeah. yeah. Oh man, I I don't know. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, what what do you think? <laughs> oh, okay. What do, what do I think? Um, first of all, <laughs> quickly, what I think about it is that like parents think that technology is like a great thing, and then they put that onto their kids because they think YouTube's there, Google's there, everything's so easy. Teachers communicate via email with students now. They have their own break rooms as kids. It's insane to see my little cousins learning digitally. Yeah. Um, And I just think because it's so easy, everything's on there. Parents are like, oh, great, use this. And then that's why kids are like, okay, I'll take this tablet from you and I'll (laughs) learn on it. So I think it's just a new generational thing because technology is adapting and that's what everybody's getting used to. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you, Jess. And Kira Rossman, you can go ahead. Oh, you're still muted. You're still muted, Kuya. Thank you so much, Josiah, for that, because that really made me look into different 
factors as well regarding effects of social media when it comes to uh, times of stress, but uh, times of distress, especially for the youth. And we also we also need to emphasize the fact, and this is research based. Many many scholars are really talking about that social media can also be the especially the works of uh, Robert Mueller. You know. Um, social media can also be a source of distress. So it bears that factor of re-traumatizing when yeah. you yeah. and us adults, you know, um, resort to social media to, to try and lessen the distress or the distress that we are feeling at that very particular moment. But I guess I, what, I want to, what I want to discuss right now and talk about why the youth res resort to social media more than anything else is I would like to highlight the, the, the work of Dr. Gabor Mate. And Dr. Gabor Mate is actually an expert when it comes to relationship, um, which, which he wrote the book, Hold On to Your Kids, okay? In, in that book, the premise is that the youth usually resort not only in the social media, but to their fellow youth, because mm -hmm. there is no attachment between the adults, their parents, their teachers. So the attachment theory or the attachment is lacking. When I say attachment, there's no real relationship except for the blood that is happening between the parents because mm -hmm. between parents, between the adults, between the, between the teachers, because number one, there's no conversation happening. Number two, there is no deliberate touch when we say deliberate touch is not malice or whatnot but mm -hmm. hey um how's your day just a simple tap will change someone else's day because scientifically right it it that's human connection that 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 changes our our hormones in our bodies yeah. that can make make us happy or sad and so therefore this attachment theory is missing and so the attachment towards the adults are missing therefore the youth will have a, youth and children will have to resort and put that attachment somewhere else therefore which is instant social media mm -hmm. their fellow youth so mm -hmm. instead of attaching to an app, they resort to social media. Oh, this is an easy factor. I can relate to the experience of this social media influencers. Therefore, these are the people that I would like to watch in case that I feel blue and I feel distressed. But does that resolve the problem? We know that it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kriya Rossman. And Tommy, do you want to add on something there? Yeah, just a few quick things. Like I think to like an answer that I would give to the question you asked Josiah earlier as to like why I think rather than like picking up a book, we're or kids these days are more likely to like pick up their phone. I think like FOMO, which is the fear of missing out for anyone who's never yeah. heard that term. <laughs> FOMO <laughs> equals fear of missing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I think especially with like how like things are spread spread so quickly um, in the digital, I guess, world, I feel like that could be a reason why people would rather um, pick up their phone because they don't want to be behind on like the latest yeah. trend or the latest meme that's going around or like, did you see what happened at the Oscars? <laughs> you know, things yeah. that like, their friends would be talking about. Um, but I think answering the question on the screen um, some reasons people resort to like social media. Josiah kind of hinted at something I was thinking is like escapism. I think mm -hmm. instead of facing your own problems, it's a lot more appealing sometimes to just get that instant gratification of like, okay, I can almost disappear into another world so I don't have to think about like what I'm going through. Um, yeah. And I think there's also the aspect of like, relatability that drives people like but there's a, a flip side to it because I think we only see such a small part of people's lives so while they seem relatable yeah. because we actually don't have that connection with them like um, Ross yeah. mentioned 
it almost makes you feel worse because you just mm -hmm. see like their their highlights and stuff like that so yeah. I think I don't know it's, it's there's some maybe good qualities but I also have a love-hate relationship with it um, yeah so I think while it can help like temporarily um deal with stress it's not good long term yeah in my opinion yeah yeah thank you for that yeah no I, I agree like it's honestly like always a love-hate relationship with social media right because at the at the other end we've also been connected more to the recent news like like when blm was going on everyone was so empowered to just continue sharing um the the movement right to to kind of show support um during also like this time of like the, the war that's happening in ukraine um it's like it's mass sharing right but at the same time it's also a source of distress like what you guys have all mentioned because people have been seeing these things and because they've seen they're seeing it it's hard to stop like shush or like seeing all these notifications or seeing all these stories about kind of like these sources of distress such as like like the, the war or like what was happening before in the blm movement in the us it, it's it's very stressful but um yeah so it's already six uh 726 so we are now nearing and i just want to give this time to promote a little bit about the fly project with uh this lisa um so whenever you're ready uh you can come in to the picture again okay perfect wow <laughs> i just can't contain my emotions right now it's very touching, very emotional, very genuine. I just want to cry. <laughs> um, I didn't see your perspective, guys. Thank you. So this is not just for youth. This is for us parents. This is for us adults. Listening to your stories are for us. We're learning from this. See, I have practiced as a social worker, but again, I am kind of detached from that world already and now I'm reconnected. So thank you, thank you for the youth <laughs> for coming together and doing this for the youth. So in response to that, I have just like uh, listed or identified the problems that you have mentioned that you have talked about. So I heard support system, lack of support system in there. I heard uh, financial concerns economic instability, insecurity brought about by this pandemic. Uh, I heard like social media that is not very helpful for the youth. There's a good side and bad side in, in being part of the social media. And uh, in response to that, we're just like, I'm just like really very proud, proud again of the faces here, how we came up with youth. It's just like, I said, wow, it's like really feeling. How did we come up with this? I haven't heard you telling me the stories. When we prepared all this, like our grant proposal or writing, but it's just like really fitting while listening to your stories. So I just want to share this quickly because um, this is kind of like our response to this problem uh, that is going on right now. And I want to share my screen. Uh, just a very quick overview again, hopefully quick, because it's just like, I just have two minutes left. So this is what our For the Love of Youth is. And just, this is the framework. So this is our Fly Hub here in, in Calgary, our Fly Hub. And we reach out to, you, you mentioned about lack of support system. We only have like a very few professionals who would be responding to problems, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, teachers, counselors, we're lacking of those. So we're gonna be reaching out to the colleges, universities, we're gonna re be reaching out to the students and uh, we will be reaching to the business affiliates to gain some support, to build that support system. So not just like the professionals, like psychologists, uh, like Grossman and all other, like even consultants, all professionals. We will target 1000 youth, 15 to 30 years old to be part of this project. And uh, we have four key uh, objectives, and that is academic uh, persistence. You talk about why and what, like the the education system right now is like kind of like ob uh, obsolete. Obsolete. They're, they're not like current anymore. So you talk about mentorships and 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 mental mental well being, and this is what we plan to do. Because again, because of the lack of professionals, we're gonna do 
youth themselves will be doing tutorial services. You mentioned about uh, kids talking to their peers, it's because they can relate more to them and instead of talking to parents, right? So instead of doing that, then let's use our youth to do the peer counseling, right? So comprehensive mentorship, let's use our youth to do the tutoring building educational aspirations and resiliency. We're gonna hire people to do part-time work, like uh, kids, students. You talk about so um, financial concerns. Maybe we can help out our youth by providing them with part-time job while they're going to school. Uh, increasing connectivity, social media is like hurting people or hurting youth. Now let's make it beneficial by providing IT trainings, marketing workshops, let's see youth, let, let's maximize their full potential in posting educational information instead of TikToking, right? So, so these are our, like what the uh, For the Love of Youth is about. And again, speaking of how many people we're gonna be involved in this one. So we're targeting 1,000 people and this is what we need to implement this project. So we have a lot of positions uh, available to make this uh, project realistic. But again, let's wait. I really would love to submit this sharing or like talk right now to the government to let them know, to let them hear, listen to you, let's listen to your stories. And then they can realize that there's need funding for this project, right? So again, thank you so much. And Bayo will end the, the session. Thank you so much, everyone. I was muted, sorry. But yes, thank you so much, Ms. Lisa. See, sometimes we just need like adults that will really support um, the youth on in a long term and not just, you know, not just once in a while. But um, because we have been talking about mental health and I know that some parents here, some youth that are probably watching, um, that are looking to look for more resources. These are some of the resources that we have. I will also send it in the chat here. So, oh, I'm so sorry about that. So we have CMHA, um, the Distress Center, the Addiction and Mental Health help helplines, um, wellness together, Calgary communities against sexual abuse, and JB music therapy. So these are all um nonprofit organizations that are looking to provide services for for different, many, many different um topics or issues that you are concerned about. You can share this with your friends, people that you think needs um, a little bit more guidance. I know CMHA um and as well as uh I believe Wellness Together and Calgary Communities Against Sexual Abuse have some um, teaching resources that you can use to educate yourself a little bit more on some of these topics. Um, and I just wanted to highlight for emergencies and conflict resolutions, please do not call the police in Calgary, call the Bear Land Patrol, okay? So the Bear Land will help you. They are trained to, um, to in conflict resolution and to just help if you see someone in the streets or if you see if you see one of your friends having um uh kind of kind of kind of uh, in, in the streets or acting some some or that needs extra help call the bear clan patrol the website is right there or 4036082401 so yeah um and and just here so we are, are now ended we with our discussion. So thanks everyone for attending. Um, Jazz sent a feedback form for us just to improve our talks in the future. I, we have an upcoming one on, um, on April, May again, and uh, as well as every other month. So we always have a, an, a talk every month. Um, next month on May, it will be on um, students, international students and the different pathways that they have. So we will have um, certified R6 that will be talking on that one and we welcome you guys to join that one as well. Um, and also just if you can send them the social medias for the Expert Collective. So this one says the Expert Collective social medias. We have our website, it is actively in, um, it is active, it is up and running. Um, we are just making some minor changes with it. We also have a YouTube. So our YouTube, we are still trying to figure out, um, we're going to be posting the talk here and our previous talk on our YouTube as well. And um, yeah, so I, I believe uh, Kriya Rossman will be adding some more resources, but yeah. So if everyone can just follow, give that a like, give us a follow and please stay tuned for our next one. 
Um, I, I will stop the live soon. I will let there you go. Before you yeah. stop, Bea, I just want to give you a big round of applause for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rosman, Tommy, Jess, and Bea. Thank you. I'm so yeah. impressed by like the thoughts, the knowledge, and yeah, it's just like overwhelming. <laughs> awesome yeah and before everyone goes i will we will be sending um a follow-up uh email so you will have the resources the links to some of the research and um on on your emails that you have uh subscribed with us too so yeah thank you again everyone for coming i will now end the facebook live um if i can get our panelists to please stay a little bit behind that would be great so I will stop my share and I will end the Facebook Live. So again, thank you, everyone. And we will see you on May. Okay, bye. And if the, the panelists can stay. <laughs>